Welcome to our first webinar on this very different topic. I'm sure you're all wondering why we chose it. And so I'll give you a bit of context. I'm sure if you've been on our website, you see that we're offering some courses on inclusive digital economies, one which is the inclusive digital economy development and in the other, um, or small i, D, E, D, and the other ones is ideals or inclusive digital um, economy and in leadership, um, which Sepetile can speak more on. And so the purpose of this webinar is a topic which is under this um, umbrella of topics under inclusive digital economies, um, which I believe is something you'd all want to be interested in hearing as it's such a relevant and timely topic because it touches on everyone. It touches on myself, it touches on Judith here, which is our guest speaker, and I'm somewhat having a very big fangirl moment right now because I follow a lot of her posts on LinkedIn. And it touches on everyone else who is here, all of the attendees, because and we're talking about a big topic on, yes, cyber risks, but data privacy. When you look at the, 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 the main, the one, point privacy, which is the right to be let alone, which is everyone's right. It is a human right. But going back to qualifying it, under our different um, focus areas, we have inclusive digital economies, which you would have also seen in our Pathway to 17 Summit that we just had last month, which was so exciting, a great success, where we touched on um, data privacy. We looked at fostering digital trust, um, we looked at um, um, regional harmonization and digital transformation and all of these exciting things that everyone wants to explore these days. But in us all moving to the digital era, what is happening? Our data is becoming more easily accessible. And so now the, it starts raising these questions on how do I still remain protected or how does my data still remain protected as it becomes more accessible as everything is becoming digital. So I'll pause there before I introduce the rest of our discussion to just put, give you a bit of housekeeping that Seputil has already put in the chat that, um, welcome everyone. I'm so excited that you're all here. Please put all your questions in the Q&A. I know you're tempted to rush to the chat, but it's easier for me to handle them in the Q&A and I know you. It, it's easy for you to go to the chat because you're used to seeing, especially my face in our class calls, as I'll be seeing some, some maybe some names in our class call tomorrow for AML and for our instant and inclusive payment systems course tomorrow as well in our class call. But please um, put your questions in the Q&A so it's easier for me to um especially categorize them and see how best to package them for Judith and see how we can best discuss them. But if you want to, especially the greetings to see where everyone's coming from, that's great to put in the chat. It's nice to see that we've got people from Bangladesh, Ethiopia, Nepal, Malawi, all the diversity here in the, in the webinar. And so I'm so excited to see everyone from all over the world joining us here. And it would be great to hear the questions from the different perspectives, especially hearing whether you do have legislations in your country or any form of law on the definitions used that cover any form of data privacy or speak to anything around there or cyber risks or cyber security um, in your country. So our discussion today with Judith, where she'll also share a presentation with us, we'll be looking at the relationship between cyber risks and data privacy program management. And so if these topics sound new to you, it's okay, don't panic. You, you it, just come along with the ride and you'll, fi you'll find your feet. And some of the themes we'll explore is how to coordinate with your so-called information regulator or, or whatever they're called in your jurisdiction. So the regulator in charge or in enforcing um, the data protection or privacy law. Um, the relationship between your cybercrime laws and your data privacy and protection laws and 
now looking forward and seeing that we're all moving towards digitalization and becoming a digital world and how and why it is important to prioritize digital trust and how to prioritize it. And many of you are even thinking, what is digital trust? I'll quickly pop in a link from our Pathway to 17 Summit where we discuss fostering digital trust with um, Daniel from the World Economic Forum, Paul Truman from MasterCard, and um, Ravi, who's the Dean from the Fletcher School at Tufts University, which is an incredible discussion. So before I take up more time, uh, I'll briefly touch on an introduction of Judith, but I don't wanna take it away from her. So I'll give her the floor to expand more. But Judith Radcliffe um, is a data protection officer, but she's also a subject matter expert within data privacy and data protection. Um, and she's a leader in the field. But let me hand the floor over to you, Judith, so you can introduce yourself um, to our attendees, who I'm, also, who I'm sure are also excited to hear what you have to share with us today. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um... I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I'm so honored to be invited. Um, I first saw you on a presentation. So I, I'm just so touched and honored that, 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 that you've invited me here, really. Um, I think that the fangirl thing goes both ways, <laughs> definitely. Um, but I could spend all day saying that, so I'll, 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 I'll get on with things. Um, I have, I've worked in the privacy and data protection arena for a little over 10 years. Um, I've worked for a wide range of public and private sector organizations. Currently, I'm sort of pretty much working for myself, but I also write children's stories for which this time I've had to make sure I'm very careful because I've become almost a data controller and I've had to get parental consent because there are real children in my latest children's story. Um, and I'll go into the whys and wherefores maybe a bit later on if people are interested, but yeah, that, that's definitely an interesting thing. Um, I have a newsletter out called Official Sensitive Private on LinkedIn. Anybody can go in and have a look at that if, if you want. At the moment, it's on the data protection and digital information bill, but other legal updates will be discussed at some point. Um, and I've done lots of panel discussions on Privsec Global and the most recent one on ties on cloud computing and data protection in the cloud space. Um, and most recently, I also have a newsletter out on uh, a newsletter, <laughs> a petition uh, to try and keep the UK GDPR as it is. Um, the link should be in the speaker information, but it's also again on my LinkedIn profile if you need to find it there. And I have um, a book on personal data breaches, which will be coming out in the new year. Um, there's only a few really really quick caveats, which is that nothing that I say should be taken to be legal advice. I am not a fully qualified barrister. So if you do feel you need legal advice after this discussion for any reason, do please go to speak to a solicitor or barrister of, of your choice. And at no point will I be discussing previous or current employers, just as the other caveat there. But thank you so much for inviting me and I hope you enjoy today's discussion. Thank you so much, Judith. So, you know, before we get to your prepared presentation, I just want to start with laying the foundation so that we start off with the, having the same language. So that when you start getting into the, the nitty gritties, everyone is at the same level, we're, we're all talking the same language and there's no ambiguity anywhere. So, you know, with data privacy now suddenly becoming so popular, well, not suddenly, but it's become so popular and it's spoken about everywhere, the true essence of what it means may have been lost. Because now, if you say a word a lot of times, eventually it starts, you know, the bubble gum effect, and then you're like, data privacy, data privacy, and you're like, but now what does it mean? Um, and then this may dangerously result in a lot of countries or jurisdictions uh, without data privacy um, uh, and protection legislations, copying and pasting these from what we've seen in, in the past from the developed world to the developing world, where you see countries will take GDPR, which is an excellent example of um, a data a privacy and protection law, but then they'll copy that and paste it and say, this is our law now, just change the country, maybe a few things here on what we call PII, and then say, this is now our law for the Shire 
I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan. <laughs> and then and then this is their new law. And so, <clears throat> but this is a big problem because now they're not considering their context and what it means for their people, because it has a lot of implications in enforcement and how, what their, their technological configurations will mean and so on and so forth. And eventually what the cost of compliance will end up looking like. And so if we take a step back from to the beginning and from your expert experience and expertise, can we just start back and say, you know, definitions are so important from, especially from the legal perspective, but even not from the legal perspective, but from even your working day to day, if you're looking to not just understand from the privacy profession, but just from understanding if you're interested um, to know what privacy is about, because at some point it will influence your work in any any way, depend it, it, no matter which department you're in. So let's just start off with discussing before we get to even asking you what is data privacy, what is privacy? Can we start off there and and just look at that on as as people? What is privacy? Yes, that's that, that's a very good question, and it's it's a great one to start off with. And I'll, before I go into what I've prepared, um, because also I know we've got a little bit longer today, um, mm. I will go into one of my favorite books. Um, it's called The Elusive Pimpernel, and it's by uh, a lady called Baroness Bauxy. Um, and in that book, there is a description of a, it's a prison and it has no doors. And the reason why it has no doors is because it's just a room that backs onto another room, but the person who is keeping someone prisoner is basically in that other room most of the time. So you have nowhere to hide. You have no privacy. And that's something that people might want to keep at the front of their minds when we're discussing privacy, because it's about that, you know, you have no doors, you have nowhere to hide. But that's kind of important because on the flip side, it's not just a you have nowhere to hide if you've done something wrong. It's everything is suddenly very, very public. So to go into the legal background a little bit, privacy is short for the right to respect for your private life your family life, your home, and your correspondence. Um, so it's a right which is written most clearly in the European Convention on Human Rights, Article 8. Um, and I've put the guide in a LinkedIn um, link with a list of resources, but we can also share those around. I'll share that list also um, with the team at the Digital Frontiers Institute. So you'll have it afterwards that can be sent around in an email as well. Um, it's also in the Human Rights Act 1998, again, Article 8, and it's also in the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, Article 12. So those of you in the United States of America trying to tell me you have no privacy rights, that isn't true. <laughs> um, it's also uh, some part of your privacy are also protected if you're in the United Kingdom by PECA, which is the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations 2003, and also the Privacy Directive, which is also part of the European uh, coverage as well. And although some organizations may claim that the right to privacy is only enforceable against public authorities, this hasn't actually been the case in practice. So if you look at European Court of Human Rights cases, it's particularly clear when you look at the reasonable expectation of privacy at work, supermarkets, for example, have gotten into trouble because they didn't respect the right to, reason to a reasonable expectation of privacy at work. Um, there are also aspects of UK statutes um, and UK common law. Um, so UK statutes include um, the Human Rights Act, I've already mentioned, the UK GDPR, um, PECA, the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations 2003, which again I've already mentioned, and also variations of the Data Protection Act 2018 is the latest one, but there may be another one soon, we'll see. Um, and there have been previous versions, uh, including the 1998 um, act for that as well. But there's also aspects of common law, and there are other UK laws which enshrine this. Um, so to take just a few of these, there's the NHS Act, the National Health Service Act 2006, 
which is about a patient's right to confidentiality. You keep your medical stuff private. And when you go to see a doctor, that's private. Um, there's also Montgomery v. Lanarkshire Health Board, which outlines the rules on fully informed consent and also your personal autonomy in relation to medical treatment, what you say yes to and what you say no to. Um, and it's also, we have things like the torts of trespass and which is things like going onto somebody's property without their consent and criminal offences of false imprisonment and trespass against the person, rape and also anti-stalking laws. And I can go into a little bit more about the law and the legalistic side of it, um, perhaps a little bit later on if, if, if we need to and if we have time. But the key point to all this is, and in a little bit more human language, essentially privacy all boils down to control. You controlling your own life, what happens to your body and your mind and the extent to which you make some or all of what you do public or keep it private and protecting your reputation from damage. And these things then go on to protect you from other harms, which can in some cases be very serious. Mm. So a, thick, a, few, a few quick uh, examples in business scenarios might be, I've already mentioned respecting the privacy of your employees. So no biometrics for entry or anything else, no constant electronic monitoring. So for example, things that read your emails and suggest who to respond to when, and even in some cases how. Um, having offline services available, so this means you need on paper, filing cabinets, letters and face to face over the counter services available, even yes in the digital age, and that includes for things like criminal records checks, counter terrorism checks and banking, and I'll come on to the whys and the wherefores um, a little bit later on, but just to, to put that again forefront of people's minds. Things like visits to a doctor, again I've already mentioned medical stuff, so you go by yourself generally um, or only with those that you want to have with you more recently we've seen people doing things like group consultations but that doesn't work for everyone and people may want to keep things a little bit more private private rooms for private conversations um, non-smart technology and non-smart cars partly because uh, my understanding at the moment is people can hack cars very easily and then lock the owners out and do all sorts of interesting things with them on your behalf <laughs> Yeah. Um, and then also things like personal and work computers that don't automatically connect you to an internet service provider or to the cloud. Again, um, I've got computers in my house that I've had for many, many years that you switch them on and you don't have to put in a password because they aren't automatically connected. My most recent personal computer that I bought during the pandemic I can't do that. It automatically pretty much connects online and the service provider sends updates to my computer and most of them I can't refuse because it's automatically and always online, whether or not I've actually connected to the internet in order to do something on the internet or not. So thank you for that, Judith. I think that's such a, a key explanation because if you understand the definition of privacy, then it's a simple step moving on to when I ask you then that what is data privacy and the extension to which why is data privacy and protection important especially as we move deeper into the digital world yeah that's 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 certainly true it's 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 it's, it's mm -hmm. very important so can you give a bit of insight into that Yes, yes, sorry, of course mm -hmm. I can, absolutely. <laughs> um, so let, let, let me take um, what data um, privacy is, um, first of all. Um, so data privacy, it's also known as data protection here in the UK, um, and it is just one set of your privacy rights. Um, your data protection rights give you power or control over who can collect, use and keep your personal data what they can collect, use, and keep your personal data for, how long they can keep it for. So for example, you can choose which organization you have a bank account with, and you can also stop that bank from sending you marketing letters, emails, and text messages. And once a set number of years have passed after you stop being a customer of the bank, that bank must then destroy your personal data, so they aren't allowed to keep it forever. You have particular controls over your personal data and can ask organizations to do or not to do things with and to your personal data. 
and the controls in particular are called data subjects rights. Mm. And they are set out within the General Data Protection Regulation, the GDPR, and the UK GDPR, the United Kingdom's version of the GDPR. So I'm speaking about Europe and the UK here. You may have a different law applicable um, in your own uh, nation, country, and where you are right now. But in terms of the GDPR and the UK GDPR, you and I and all of the other people in the world are known as data subjects. Mm. And data subjects rights include, to give just a few examples, some of the most important ones, the right to be informed. So this is the right to know what an organization wants to do with your data. And they usually have to give you that information before you sign up with them, before you agree to have anything done with them. You also have the right to access a copy of the data that an organization has collected about you and the right to check what exactly that organization has done and is doing with your data. And that's the right to access. And that usually narrows it down also a little bit from um, the right to be informed, which might be their generic stuff, what they usually do with everything. Whereas the right to access is, well, what are you actually doing with it? Yeah. Now you've got it. Um, there's also the right to rectification the right to have incorrect data corrected, including having false allegations removed once they have been proven false, and also the right to have incomplete data completed if you want it completed. And then there's also the right to erasure, which is the right to have data destroyed, where, for example, an organization should have asked your permission to collect your data, but didn't. An organization has collected your data without any legal justification for doing it, an organization might have tricked or pressured you into agreeing to something and saying they can have your data, but actually they shouldn't have. An organization might have used your data for things that it actually isn't allowed to use your data for, whether because the law says no, or because they should have asked for your permission first, or where an organization has kept your data for too long, or again in that situation where false, allegation have been, false allegations have been proven false, and that's, you know, you know what expunging your records is. It's, it's that, basically wiping the slate clean. Um, and now I'll come on to the second part of the question, which is the sort of why is it important, um, especially as we move deeper into the digital world? It's such a good question, and I'm so glad that, that, that it's been asked. Um, no, no, really. Um, it's, first of all, you know, explicit consent is becoming more important than ever, you know, you mentioned, you know, that things are more accessible and available online. And that, that's why, you know, that's why it's, it's so much more important to, to say, you know, are you okay with this? Um, give people options to do things offline. I know I go on about this quite a lot, but you, you've got to still keep that balance because online isn't right for everyone. And I'll come on to the sensitive personal data aspects of that as well later on. Um, AI algorithms and machine learning must be tempered by human oversight. That is crucial, especially if you want people to trust the AI, which is what we're often asked to do at the moment. And protecting privacy and data can also arguably save you costs and also help save the planet. So that's also quite an important thing. But why or why is explicit consent so important? Well, it's becoming more important than ever. And there are three simple rules that you need to teach your teams, particularly your analytics teams and your machine learning teams. So the first rule is just because we have it doesn't mean we can use it. You need to ask permission and get clear and unambiguous permission before you take and use someone's data. Now, I'm not saying this for absolutely everything before you've got it, because we all know there are more lawful bases than just consent, right? Mm -hmm. But once you've got someone's data, if you have taken it for one or more specific purposes, and those are the effectively what has almost been agreed that you can have it for, whether it's because the law has said you can or because somebody has given their agreement for it, or whether because there's a contract or something like that, no matter what lawful basis you've originally used, where you've got something that somebody wouldn't then expect you to use their data for, and usually that includes things like analytics and machine learning, because usually that hasn't been made clear or you haven't asked first, then you need to go back and say, okay, well, we took it for this, but please can we now use it for this as well? And that is because otherwise people won't know about it. 
Um, and it's also, it's what's almost known as a secondary purpose. So it's unexpected. It's purposes that may be in some instances incompatible with the original purposes. So it's all of that Article 5.1b GDPR stuff. But generally what we like to call it in data protection <clears throat> world, because it's a bit more friendly is unexpected use. Um, the second thing is public domain isn't fair game. And I, I know it's misleading because you think, oh, well, it's out there, it's on the open internet. And it's so easy to fall into the trap, especially if you're a financial crime analyst. Um, but so my face and my voice, they're out there. They're out in, 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 in the public domain. Uh, they're out there because I've been on the radio. They're out there because I do things like this. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, uh, and, but that doesn't mean that I'm happy for any organization to just grab my face or my voice and use it for anything they want. It doesn't mean that I would be happy for, I'll take an example that's been in the news recently, Clearview AI <laughs> to grab my face and my voice and run their biometrics on it and then sell that AI algorithm to various parties or let the police use it or all those mm. things that the ICO said, um, can you destroy all of the UK people's data that you've taken and used that for, please? We don't like it and probably neither will they. Um, nobody, nobody's asked for my permission. And unless you ask me, my response is not going to be yes <laughs> in that instance for that, you know. Um, and in most cases, if you want to use my personal data or private things to add to an AI database that you then let other organizations use, and or if you want to use my personal data or private things to train AI or algorithms or for machine learning, ask my permission and get a definitive yes from me first, preferably in writing, really, in an ideal world, so you can prove it afterwards. And if I say no or just don't respond, it just means no, so don't do it. There's none of this implied consent. <laughs> we want to get away from implied consent as far as we possibly, possibly can. Um, we don't like it. It's not good. <laughs> um, so if you follow the rules I've described, you will arguably go some way towards avoiding the rebuke and sanctions dished out, particularly to Clearview AI, and more and more are coming in for them every day. France has recently said, you shouldn't be doing that to our citizens either. Um, and there's also been Kerbo Inc and Ever Album, which are UK cases in which a UK court and also the Federal Trade Commission have been not looking on them with a friendly eye, should we say. So let's go a little bit into sort of putting things online and, and what that can mean. So putting things online can mean that everything a hacker needs to steal your identity and not only empty your savings accounts, but also potentially steal your life is online and available within a few cracks of hashing or encryption or a password. So this is why I keep saying sensitive data and banking data, people might actually want to keep that offline. So you don't want to be making that choice for them. You want to be giving them the choice, letting, telling them, okay, here are all the risks and then letting them make that decision themselves. Um, and here's another thing for you that you may not know about. And certainly I only know because I've been through a certain process recently. So when counter-terrorist checks are done online in the UK, the organizations that run them correspond by email. And in the past few years, your date of birth has been requested on most emails for identification purposes. Now, you and I know that date of birth is one of the key security questions for banking. And yeah. also they're on your passport, they're on your driving license, they're on your birth certificate. So asking somebody to put their date of birth in the main body of every email so you can identify them makes it really, really easy when those emails go astray or are hacked for an unintended person to get hold of them. Um, the cloud leaks, we all know the cloud leaks. We see that every day. Um, and there's also something interesting. I can't remember whether it was the FBI or the CIA that said it, but one of the big American security agencies said, look, if a company hasn't been hacked, they either don't know they've been hacked or they're going to be hacked. <laughs> and, and I think that still holds true. I mean, even the director of the CIA in a clip that I love showing in webinars and presentations has had his emails hacked. And the hacker went through and they were like, oh yeah, we've got his <clears> security <throat> number, we've got all this other stuff. And you know, that, that, that is a result of, of, of putting things online where arguably perhaps maybe we should be keeping those offline and keeping those a bit more private in that sense. 
So what does all this mean in, in a digital world? Well, I've spoken about, you know, give people the choice offline or online and tell them about all the risks, not only to their personal data, but also to their private life. Also to, you know, what risks or harms could happen to you, the identity theft, the all this other stuff like theft of money before you put their data into that digital space before you say right you must all have online bank accounts that may not be right for everyone and people may not feel comfortable or happy doing it it is also important to make sure that your ai or algorithms and automated decision making are tempered by proper human oversight and this is so that if or when computers make decisions about people that the underlying reasoning and the data used to make those decisions is made available to the people the decisions are made about. It's also so that people are invited and encouraged to challenge those decisions. That's also really important. And people are given clear and easy ways to challenge the decisions, get their own point of view recorded, and importantly, can get a human being to review the decision. And it can't be like what happens at some organizations now where you're going through the complaints process and even where people review it, one person reviews it, gives a response, but it may not be a fair decision. So it gets queried and then it's, ah, yeah, no, but the other person we've relied on their report, therefore we're still saying no. That can be wrong even when a person is the first reviewer, shall we say. It's even more important that the human being, when AI makes a decision, is suitably independent and sceptical so that they properly scrutinize this decisions, don't rely on the computer's report or the previous report, go right back to the beginning so that they can see all the steps made and overturn them if they are wrong. It's really no good if we end up in a, the computer said so, so it must be right scenario which appears to happen more often than you might think, and which actually was also one of the key failings, arguably, in the Post Office Limited scandal, which is ongoing in the UK at the moment. Big headline hitter. And it was because, partly because, as I understand it from what I've read, the Post Office were adamant that they were going to protect the Horizon system from any and all criticism. And my understanding of the case is that people were even made to sign things to go, oh yes, well, no, on, on, there is nothing wrong with the system or words to that equivalent. I'm paraphrasing here, but that's, <laughs> that's the gist. And you know that was one of arguably the core failings. It was, we'll protect the computer, not the people. Mm. Um, so it's also vitally important to remember that computers do get things wrong um, and it isn't necessarily a one-off when they do. Um, so some things are better and just as effective without the use of computers and without AI. Um, and some of that includes things like security. So let's talk about biometrics for a little bit now in terms of that. So biometrics, and I, I'm going to say something very, very controversial here, um, but biometrics is arguably a complete waste of time and money for security and also exposes people to huge risks of having their identities stolen. Mm. So probably the second half of that sentence is less controversial than the first, but hear me out. So Big Brother Watch released a report in 2018, which confirmed that from the data they collected, and this is police matching people here, on average, 95% of matches wrongly identified innocent people. And police, photo, police forces have stored the photos of all people incorrectly matched by automated facial recognition systems, which apparently has led to the storage of biometric photos of thousands of innocent people being retained. Now, if you see my LinkedIn posts on a regular basis, you will all know how I feel about use of statistics to make your case. Very yeah. bad idea. However, Big Brother Watch's figures appear to be based on over 50 freedom of information requests. And there are also quite a few real life tales that appear to support this view, such as one from the New York Times, which the headline ran like this, another arrest and jail time due to a bad facial recognition match. So you must draw your own conclusions. But to me, that seems fairly compelling. And my conclusions are that it means that when your organization invests in biometrics, you may just be being conned out of money that you could better spend on improving client services, on making profits, and also in things like physical security that is tried and tested and actually works. I know you probably all have physical security guards in your buildings, right? When, when you're in them, when it's not massively locked down for COVID, mm. who know your workers by sight, and actually can really easily identify newcomers and interlopers. 
And that's just one example. And arguably with biometrics and things like that, there's a huge, huge cost to you regarding electricity and also therefore the environment when you use biometrics and other arguably unnecessary technology because electricity takes power, takes natural resources. So actually getting privacy right and getting that balance right in the digital age will arguably not only save your organization costs, but will also save the planet. Hmm. So thank you so much, Judith. I, I see you now discussing the cross between privacy and security. And I like that you're touching on that because you're leading me to a question that I wanted to put in, but now you've, you've, you've brought it to a nice place where I, um, when you were discussing um, the fact that you can't just use people's data because it's out there in the so-called public domain. And it's making me think that as we think about countries that still don't have privacy laws where um, in Africa, we know that uh, like 67% um, of African countries only uh, approximately have uh, data privacy laws. We don't know if all of them are enforcing them, but they have in place. Um, you think uh, We're thinking, okay, they have these laws in place, but in, in drafting them, did they think about um, putting in the seven principles of privacy by, des by design? In, in in the so in um in the in the form of that it should be a default and, and and that it shouldn't be reactive and that people mustn't actively say no don't use my data but it should be default in that companies must it should be second nature that I must ask and not yeah. I, I can take and um other things that come along with that is um I must I, I can't just do as I please. Um, uh, it's embedded into everything that I do. I can't just put into an AI, into a machine learn, learning model that I'm de developing to figure out how women are identified or how female voices sound because of all these YouTube videos that are found and I can just scrape them off the web and decide to run that through my machine learning model and then de develop what whatever I'm, I'm developing. And then it takes me back to the insecurity, thinking about the triad, your CIA of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And then you think about now, how does the two, the two, the relationship between the two come together? And which is the whole point of this webinar on the nexus between cyber risk and or cybersecurity and um, privacy. And then now my, my question, um, yes, we were thinking about, I put, I prepared a question there, but now I want to, um, so it's move on to something else and think, okay, so this is where we are now. Um, some countries are only, some people are only still grappling with learning about this and, you know, thinking about, oh, actually these two are becoming more and more related as we move into the digital era and they're not separate functions anymore or strictly separate functions anymore, but are becoming more and more complementary. But how, <clears throat> how do they work together on privacy by design, but at the same time, working on the zero trust um, advice from cybersecurity frameworks and models towards um, developing systems that protect the privacy and uh, the data privacy and protection, that protect the, the data of people and ensure that their privacy and protection is respected whilst not being too cumbersome and ensuring that the system is robust at the same time. But at the same time, we can see that there's a huge skills gap. I mean, recently the World Bank um, developed a fund to address the skills gap, particularly amongst women. It's amazing that it, in, this pan, in this panel, it's, it's, in this discussion, it's myself, it's you and myself, and the Seputile helping answer some of the questions in the Q&A, three women. But one of the biggest, 
uh, skills gaps they identify is that there are very few women within this space. And so this is a, is a significant risk, not only just that there are few women, but the skills gap is massive in the cybersecurity field, in the data privacy field, and in the data management field, where all three are starting to become so complementary as we move towards a digital world. So how can we address this growing symbiotic relationship to help it work together while also trying to match up the skills gap before I hand over to you to give your presentation because I'm looking at time. Yeah, of course. And, and that, that's also a really good question. Um, and again, I'm so glad you answered it. I'll ask, answered it, asked it, <laughs> and answered it a little bit in, in, what, in what you were saying as well, actually. Um, so first of all, I suppose I take a different view on zero trust. I don't think we should have zero trust in quite the way it's done at the moment. At mm -hmm. the moment, there appears to be a lot of zero trust on your customers and on your employees, yeah. right? On yes. your own, yeah. on your own people. Own people I'll put yeah. it that way. On your own people, there seems to be a lot of, you know, we won't trust them. Um, and for me, that's the wrong way around. For me, the zero trust aspect needs to be on your vendors and on your suppliers and on your cloud service providers, for example. And I'll come onto that a little bit in my presentation because the first bit's on cloud due diligence that you need to do on them. Um, but you, you need to be trusting your people. Um, and the reason why is, so I was at a cybersecurity talk and it's really interesting because many cybersecurity professionals from my perspective, and this is, this is my perspective, so other perspectives are completely valid, you know, so, but um, I was, they, they're quite a well-known group um, and they were talking about keystroke logging. And I always say to people, well, it's incredibly privacy invasive and it's no good because you basically are giving everything that you are looking at to, well, one, the software person that's provided you with the keystroke logging software, right? Two, if you look at, I think it was Israel, they said, well, this is the easiest way we spy on people. We keystroke log, <laughs> if I'm remembering yeah. that correctly. I think it was Israel. It may have been somewhere else. Apologies, Israel, if I'm, you know, massively, massively defaming you or not. Um, but um, that, that, that's my understanding. Um, but also, um, it's really massively easy, not only to give away the personal data of your own employees and your customers when you do keystroke logging and encourage them to have that as a security feature, but also you arguably give away corporate secrets as well, because what is keystroke logging? Well, it's meant, it's basically writing down and copying everything you type, right? Yeah. So it's the easiest way I would argue, and I've seen security professionals um, and security software professionals even saying, well, look, it's gonna go out the door <laughs> and you, you're, you're opening the back door. And this is the problem with things like biometrics and stuff like that. And again, security professionals have been flagging this as well and saying, look, you are opening the door to having people's faces hacked. I and mean, all you need to do is watch Never Say Never Again, which is a James Bond film from many, many years ago. And they will show you how easy it is to you know, effectively hack someone's biometrics. Um, and that, that was in a film from many years ago. Um, and so that's that's the, there is a symbiotic relationship and I think the thing is we're all working at things from the same we've got the same goal we're just working at it from two slightly different ends mm -hmm. and the magic happens when we overlap and come together and agree on stuff um, but it's also I mean the fraud and financial crime team let's not forget them they are also really important so I, I basically I call it an unholy alliance between the data protection team and the privacy team, the security team and the financial crime prevention team. Again, that is where the magic happens. Um, and that is where the magic happens in terms of things like the right to rectification, the right to erasure, data minimization. Security guys tend to love that too, in my experience. And that is because if you don't have it, can't be breached, can't be stolen by a hacker, right? But also, it's more accurate and you have less looking for a needle in a haystack for things in terms of investigations. That is also true of financial crime and know your customer checks. If you don't have to wade through mountains of irrelevant data, you can find the relevant stuff much more easily. And if you've got an accurate address for somebody on file, as opposed to the address from them for 10 years ago, 
and if you've got all the people that actually yeah did it on file as opposed to the three or four of them that didn't and or you know who were proven whether before or after the investigation that they had nothing to do with it if you're still if you've still got them flagged as well these guys are a risk when they aren't how much time are your financial crime and security guys wasting scrutinizing them when you could be looking for the real bad guys <laughs> mm. exactly <laughs> Yeah. So let me share my screen before we run out of time to have your presentation up. And then we can then close our session, which I'm thoroughly enjoying. And I can see from the comments that everyone appreciates how you're making the concept so easy to understand. Oh, no. Well, um, I, as I say again, you know, thank you for inviting me. I'll make it really, really quick. So this is like the super quick version of the quick version, um, because I was presuming that I might have about 15, 20 minutes. I think we have a little less than 10 now. So if mm. I'm shooting through this, um, my apologies, but I all will be revealed and I will give out, you know, extra information and stuff afterwards and make sure the resources list and everything is also available um, to the Digital Frontiers Institute team. So if there are any burning questions as well. I'll also try and answer those. Right, so why have I started with words? Words, 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 they are so important. And I did see a question about T's and C's. And if we accept them, are we signing our rights away? That flashed up on the screen a little bit earlier. So while I'm talking about words, no. If you have somebody's terms and conditions, I know we all have to sign them. I have to sign them when I'm signing up for employment contracts and they usually get them wrong. Um, so I am not immune to having to go, yes, I accept, but I don't want to be accepting. And no, I don't want to be accepting your privacy notice terms. They've written it wrong. The words are problematic. Um, and it's always important to get the words right. You cannot, even if they're forcing you to, accept their privacy notice. It is an information notice only. They cannot make you accept that. Please do write into them with lots and lots of complaints and then they'll get the message eventually. Um, but you can't accept those even if they're forcing you to terms and conditions should not be being put in a privacy notice because as far as i'm concerned that falls under the unfair contract terms act in the uk so they can't be forcing you to it's effectively do you remember what i said about tricking you into things and pressuring you into agreeing things that you can't actually agree to that's what it is when they put terms and conditions into their privacy notice or otherwise try to make you accept through a contract something that you or i know is unlawful. Um, I've got a really good example for words, 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 but uh, eff effectively, the main message for that is think about Hamlet and what he says to Polonius. What do you read, my lord? Words, words, words. And if I say them like that, they are just totally meaningless words. So that's a key point of um, if we can have the next slide, please. That would be awesome. Thank you. Um, so cloud providers and due diligence and contracts. So really quick points for this is do due diligence on your cloud providers before you take them on. So this is in procurement competition stage. And yes, you are allowed to reject any cloud provider that does not conform with the GDPR. So they have to have all the core principles looked after, all of the Article 32 security, and they have to be able to make sure they have systems and processes and policies in place to make sure they can handle and action on your behalf every data subjects rights request from information access to rectification, erasure and opt outs and everything in between. If they don't have any of those things in place and you need to check and ask them for evidence because they will try to give you blind assurances and they are not good enough. If you look under the hood from somebody that's just trying to get away with SOC reports and assurances for privacy and data protection compliance, SOC reports we all know are security anyway, but in terms of assurances, if they're trying to give you assurances and fob you off with those, don't accept it. It isn't good enough. You want to see evidence because if they're trying to give you assurances now, what might happen when you try to audit them later? And you do have Article 28.1 of the GDPR to back you up, incidentally which is also in the UK GDPR as well, when you are asking them to comply with making sure they can do all the rights requests and show you that evidence. Because it's on you as the data controller 
to make sure that everybody that processes, so handles data on your behalf, can do what they're supposed to do. So that's kind of the cloud providers and due diligence stuff. Oh, there's another point actually that I'll bring in now as well, very briefly. I think we've got, have we got time for this? We uh, have uh, five minutes left. Yep. Okay. So very briefly then also, um, you must make sure that they are going to destroy stuff for you. So destroy means destroy. Encryption and hashing are not good enough. Now, I'll start with the law. It's the right to erasure. So it's the right to data destruction, not to have it anonymized or hashed. But also, how many of you have heard of the EncroChat case? So EncroChat was supposedly able to keep everything happily encrypted and nobody could decrypt it. Guess who decrypted it? Europol. And there are websites out there, and I was looking at this in relation to a different presentation than one I did for Ties, and there are happily available, freely open on the public internet websites that teach you how to get rid of hashing and overcome it. So if anybody tells you, as I've been told many times, oh, you know, it would take 100 years to get rid of this hashing, that may not necessarily be 100% true or accurate either. <laughs> Um, please, can we have the next slide? Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So I know we've skipped one, but that's good because data sharing is very important. I know you know about rights request handling, so we'll come back to that if we've got time in a minute. But something that's also really important, data sharing. You need to control your data sharing, particularly keep control over those credit reference agencies. And why do I say this? Well, a key failing that I've noticed, and I've noticed it, in the course of things, again, that I've had to sign where I'm trying to get employed by somebody or everything like that and in between and for bank accounts and all these kinds of things, a key failing and it is for multiple, it causes multiple issues for people, including having their data rented or sold on multiple times without their knowledge or consent. That data could end up in the hands of criminals and then it there's all sorts of wonderful chaos that can happen as a result of that. But this is because financial institutions worldwide and employers and even counter-terrorist check organizations appear to fail to specify in their contracts with credit reference agencies that the credit reference agency, once it has produced a report on the person using information supplied, you need to make sure that you have a contract in place that tells them that once they've made the credit reference check for you, they must destroy any and all copies of the data. They mustn't further use the data apart from to investigate and supply the report. And they must ideally within six to 12 months of producing the report, destroy any data within that report. And they really mustn't use any of the data either that you've supplied them or that they've got from producing the report for any of their own business purposes. So no selling or renting it on and an absolute ban on you know things like creating their own AI system with it because all sorts of personal data breaches and havoc can happen as a result of those things. And people need to know they can trust you with their data and that you will keep control of it on their behalf. And that includes controlling your credit reference agencies. I think we had a question. Yes, yeah, so one thing I wanna just bring up here or just check with you here, Judith, is that you know, most people, when they think of a data breach, especially in data sharing, they always think it comes from the outside. But sometimes with data sharing and data breaches, this is just someone from a different department who's not allowed to access the data, who's looking at it, and that is also a data breach. And I think it's something that people need to be sensitized about, that someone from the communications department seeing sensitive HR data is a data breach because they're not supposed to see that. Why are they seeing it? And some and not having a privacy culture within your organization help doesn't sensitize you to realize that. Yeah, that 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 that's a that's a really good point actually. And and so I think. The question if i'm getting this right was about because there was there was a lot in that 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 point as well and a, a very good point you've, you've almost answered the question yourself it's breaking the confidentiality of that data it's when you break the integrity of the data so 
there are a couple of different ways. The one I've just described, although very briefly, um, and possibly at the speed of an express train, um, for the credit reference agencies, you're actually breaking the confidentiality of the data if you are allowing them to sell or rent the data on to other people, because somebody has given you that data in confidence for you only to use it really for that credit reference report. That's what you've then handed that over to the credit reference agency for. Anything else, you're breaking the confidentiality of that data. And arguably then what follows is unlawful accessing or disclosure. And remember, within personal data breach territory, it's things like breaking confidentiality plus unlawful accessing disclosure of that personal data by or to somebody else. So that's that one. In things like AI and machine learning and analytics, you've also got another problem, not just breaking the confidentiality and the unlawful accessing or disclosure of somebody who was never intended to see or collect that data or use it. You've also got a potential integrity issue. So you've got the data integrity breach, the breaking of some or all of that data. And you could even end up corrupting the original data by doing that. So you've got potentially with the alteration of that data, so you break the data integrity, that leads to unlawful alteration, so changing the data. And that can lead to things like stereotyping. Stereotyping is a hugely good example, but there are also things like there was a program on Radio 4 very recently. I think it was part of File on 4. It may or may not have been. No, File on 4 was something else. Um, but there was on, it could have been the money program, it could have been you and yours, it was one of the ones that's on at lunchtime on Radio 4. But they were talking about people being marked as dead when they are very much alive. And that is a massive data integrity breach, which causes people huge problems because they then have to backtrack and say, no, no, I, I genuinely, I am alive. And if that gets shared on, say to a credit reference agency or say to somebody else, and they then share that on, and they then share that on, your whole life could collapse because somebody has marked you down as dead when you weren't. Mm. So for the final slide, brings us very nicely on to, to the, to the wrap-up, because we've only got about a minute left, probably less. And it's the thing that they don't tell you even when you're doing, in my understanding, or at least when I did it, the CIPM course. So privacy management courses don't usually tell you this. Incident management, we've got to get that renamed to personal data breaches management. And we need that done across the board in privacy and data protection and also security because personal data breaches, as I'm sure you know by now from the rest of our discussion, they are far more than just incidents and events. It's not just when a hacker has penetrated your offenses or when data has gone walking out the door, although it can be. It absolutely can be, and you shouldn't dismiss those either. But it can also be internal people getting a hold of it when they shouldn't. It can be the fact that you have given all of this HR data to analytics guys so they can play around with it and do all of their insights. And I'm not saying you should never do these things, incidentally. I'm just saying you need to do them in the right way and with the protections in there first. But that also brings me right back to the beginning where I was talking about explicit consent. And if you get somebody's consent for that further access by the analytics team, well, you've already told them about the risks and issues. They are fully on board with what you want to do and you've effectively got their thumbs up for it. So why wouldn't you use explicit consent to your advantage to get people on board for that? But also bringing it back to incident management, a really good thing that you can do, and this again ties in, ties all the three teams who are most important to this. So privacy data protection, financial crime prevention, and also cybersecurity and physical security as well. If you have one automated form on your intranet, so the internal version of the internet, for financial crime prevention teams, cybersecurity, but set up so that it goes to your data protection and privacy team as the primary team with all the questions they need answered as per the particular articles within the GDPR that gives you the set of questions you need to ask. And then, have security looped in when they need to see it. So when it's one of their events and incidents, have crime prevention teams when there's potential fraud or other financial crime aspect of it. You loop everybody in correctly with the right number of tick boxes and screens and so on. That can be a huge time saver and a cost saver. 
And it's also one thing that is very good to automate. So I think that's been a bit of a whistle stop tour. We're probably out of time by now. Thank you so much for inviting me here and listening to the presentation. I really hope it's been useful. Thank you so much, Judith. You've shared such incredible insights in such an easy to understand way. Let me stop sharing my screen. Um, we have been recording this session, so the recording will be shared together with the <clears throat> a brief summary of what we, um, Judith has discussed and shared with everyone. Um, and with um, your presentation, obviously in PDF, um, so that um, no alterations can be made. And then with <laughs> your name there, that you, um, you put things that you did not put. If you, uh, uh, we can share your PDF, and um, with your permission, um, yeah, but sure. we'll, we will um, we'll check with that with you, and we'll have a brief summary and share the recording so that we everyone can gain access to it, even those who could not attend because I think you've shared such valuable insights that are not only timely, but are relevant not only for today, but for even more time to come, because these are concepts that people really need to not only think about now, but think about going ahead, because this is becoming, not, not becoming, this is, has become and becoming a very important topic to not only think about, but to synthesize and really go deeper into the language because not only when you're not just thinking about it from a legal perspective as you uh, were talking about it definitely the words and looking at the language used and so on but also from just what does this mean and synthesizing that to what does to the proverbial tomorrow mean for us if we want to be have to maintain the right to be left alone and really keep it because we'll end up in a world where data privacy is just a word used for if i can say for decoration and but it actually means absolutely nothing um i'll hand over to you to say any last words before i say goodbye to everyone so again thank you so much for inviting me here um, very important to make sure that your privacy and data protection teams, your financial crime prevention teams and security are talking to each other. I think that's one thing that has definitely, definitely come, come, out, come out of our discussion today. Yes. Um, I did notice um, that there was a question about blockchain. Blockchain is not privacy or data protection compliant. Don't let people fool you. The reason I say that now, if it's changed, and you can now deal with um, correcting single transactions, single entries, single fields, single records, and also get those destroyed, then do you know stand up and correct me. But my understanding is that they can't at the moment and therefore they are not privacy and data protection compliant. And also why would you want a contract where you can't amend the parties? Yeah. Why would you want like the example I gave earlier, if somebody has been accused of doing something, but they didn't do it, mm. and you find out they didn't do it, how bad will you feel? And how bad might your organization look if you've got that indelibly printed somewhere where you can never ever take it off? So take be it. careful with blockchain. Um, but also to the hashing point, yes, hashing can be broken, which was the other part of which I don't think I answered in the typing it in for people. Um, hashing can definitely be broken. Um, have a look out for things like Hashcat. That was one of the things that I saw that was that was online again. As I say, I looked it up in front of a, a different set of discussions that I did, and, and that that was a, a very important one. But do do keep privacy and data protection at the forefront of your minds and, and protect yourselves. Yes. See it as a self-protection device, whether it's you personally, whether it's your family, whether it is people in your community, or even whether it's your fellow employees in terms of you don't want masses and masses of complaints. You don't want masses of customer services issues. And if you get privacy and data protection right all the way along, you will save your organization costs, you will save the business costs, and you'll save yourself a heck of a lot of heartache as well. And that's probably the thing to finish on. I think for me, before I say goodbye, imagine being marked dead on the blockchain. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. and. We'll see you on our next um, webinar that we will see when we host or with another 
topic with another stream that we have in our focus areas. And thank you again, Judith. Oh, it's, it's been such a pleasure. Um, I've learned a lot from you. I'm sure everyone else here has it from the comments that I'm seeing. And I will definitely be asking you to join us again. Um, um, so thank you again. Oh, thank, thank you. Everyone for joining us. And goodbye.